official. Well, good evening, Asia and Australia. Good afternoon, Europe and Africa. And good morning, North, Central and South America. Warm greetings to all of you and welcome. Thank you for joining us live for today's MAI webinar, Engaging Head and Heart, Devotional Writing for Today. My name is Ramon Rocha of MAI. We give special welcome to those of you who have joined an MAI webinar for the first time. We're glad that you're here and we are so happy to uh, have 26 out of the 131 participants registered from Indonesia. Uh, greetings to all of you coming from Indonesia. Praise the Lord. Uh, Tim, uh, before I formally introduce you, please greet our friends. Just say hi and wave. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm so excited to be here, and uh, I think Indonesia is the winner. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, before I turn over the floor to Tim, let me remind all of you to interact with us via the chat box for your comments, which you're already doing, greeting, uh, sending greetings. And please use the Q&A box for your questions. There will be a presentation for about 40 minutes to be followed by Q&A. Um, this meeting is being recorded and we will send you the YouTube link later. Followers of Jesus have this wonderful habit of reading the Bible every day. Together with the Bible, most of us are using a devotional guide. Usually it is a one page article for each day. Now writing one page devotional looks easy. Is that correct? <laughs> well, Tim will tell us more about that. You know, it should be short, concise, thoughtful, everything in one page. From one webinar uh, blurb, I, I quote, how do you grab from our webinar blurb in uh, Lit World, at Lit World, this was the a statement, how do you grab the reader's interest, focus their attention on God's word and give them something new to ponder all in one page. We are so blessed to have Tim Gustafson as our webinar speaker today. Tim writes for Our Daily Bread. It's a favorite devotional in many countries around the world and Our Daily Journey. And he serves as an editor for the Discovery series. He, he is a, an adopted son of missionaries to Ghana. And that will be a, another story, Tim. Um, and um, he and his wife, Lisa, are the parents of one daughter and seven sons for a total of eight children. Such a big family. Should be fun, Tim. Uh, Tim just uh, released his first exclusively his book. Uh, he's written 90 devotionals for men and the title of the book is Brother to Brother. And I heard Tim said uh, while he wrote that for men, uh, women are also enjoying this book. So uh, without further ado, Tim, we appreciate you and thank you for your time. Uh, please take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Ramon. Uh, I'm really happy to be here talking with you. And uh, before we really begin in earnest, I would like to do the most important thing and that is uh, talk to our Father. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can look at the mechanics and the motivations of writing devotionals. And Father, even as we want to write for you, we want this next hour to be honoring to you. So give me the words that you want me to share with these good people. Be with each one of them in whatever situation they are. Keep them safe, make them bold, and uh, empower them by your spirit. Help us to rely only on you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, as I write 
and edit for our daily bread, I am going to be speaking of necessity out of what we do at our daily bread and try to explain why that why I think that works and why that has been successful. Of course, the obvious reason is because God has chosen to bless it. But I think there are some some basic reasons why the our daily bread devotional format works well in today's day and age. And I understand that not all of these principles will be 100% applicable by each of you in your particular situations as to who you're writing to. You'll need to adapt them accordingly, but prayerfully, this will be of some help to you. Um, so what I want to talk about, first of all, is motivations for writing. And just to briefly stay, we're doing this to, to honor God. That would be that would be what we want to do. And we want, we want to invite the reader to come along with us. Very often, I think uh, we have ulterior motives for, for why we want to write. And I think we need to examine those. Uh, so when we want to make it about us, then we're getting off track. When we, when we want to do it for, for fame or notoriety or money, that is not a mission that is going to be conducive to good devotional writing. So I want to start with a mission statement. And uh, let me work to uh, share the uh, full screen here for you. And uh, let me tell you, I, you're seeing that you're seeing the screen there, engaging head and heart, I hope. Okay, very good. And to move on to our mission, uh, <clears throat> our mission here, simply put, is to carry out the Great Commission, which of course is to go forth and make disciples. And by making disciples, we're not, we're not just, this is not necessarily evangelistic, even though a, a big part of devotional writing may well be evangelistic, but we are trying to make disciples who are going to in turn be able to make other disciples. And our vision is to see the world come to a saving knowledge of the love of Jesus and to live with each other in that love. So it is a sense of community that we are trying to build here. That is what undergirds our goal at our daily bread. So starting with the basics, and this sounds really basic, but feed yourself first. If I am purporting to be telling other people what to think about, what kinds of thoughts to think about God for that particular day or that particular moment. And I am not stopping or even beginning my day by feeding myself. I really have no right to share anything with them. Now, for me, this has to take a, a very intentional framework. Um, I'm, I'm not naturally a very structured person. So I have to build into my life these, this framework by which I will hold myself accountable and other friends will hold me accountable as well. So I try to start the day um, by reading another devotional. And for the last several years, I've been going over and over uh, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. Um, I used that one because Chambers really makes me think, really challenges me, really stretches me. And then uh, with the particular reading plan I'm using, it also comes with a read through the Bible in a year plan, uh, which uh, also motivates me to be diving into the scriptures ourselves. And one of the biggest reasons for the existence of our daily bread was to get people to read the Bible. Way back in 1956, one of their just a very small staff at what was called Radio Bible Class. It was Henry Bosch who came to Dr. M. R. D. Hahn, the, the founder of this radio program, uh, with an idea to get the listeners to read the Bible every day. And his plan was to give them something every day that would be a story that would engage the scriptures and then would give the reader something to do and, of course, get them to read that day's Bible reading. So at the heart of it from the very start 
was directing people to read God's word. So that means we need to read it for ourselves as well. So uh, that's the plan I use. You no doubt have your own plans, but this is the really important one. And prayer. Uh, a big part of devotional writing is candor and honesty and openness with the readers. We shouldn't be telling them what to think. We should be inviting them to walk on this spiritual journey with us. And for me, a big challenge is prayer. I will start praying and I'll start thinking about a problem. And instead of really taking that problem to God, I'll naturally think about what I can do to resolve this problem. Now that might be the prompting of the Holy Spirit telling me this is your answer, but more often than not, it's me getting ahead of God. So this is something I really need to work on. And I try to share that in some of my writing. What helps me get more focused is journaling regularly. Um, journaling has a couple of really good aspects to it. One, it helps you get your own thoughts organized and preserved. But two, it also gives you a wealth of material to which you can go back later and mine for devotional writing or your book or whatever you're using. So God does use and he will use whatever we write. But first, first of all, very first, we must listen for his voice. So I can't stress that enough, um, starting with the basics. Another thing that is really important in devotional writing is the vital importance of authenticity. Now, I've already touched on this a little bit. Um, now, I've I've lived in several different cultures and uh, very different cultures. Um, the, the Ghanaian culture is quite different from the American culture, which is quite different from the Middle Eastern culture, which is quite different from the culture in Mindanao. And in a couple of these cultures, um, I've seen that uh, the writers who write spiritually are writing to tell people what to do or to tell people how they ought to be. That's not really what we're going to go for. Now, I don't believe in uh, text heavy slides, but this is a text heavy slide because I wanted you to see this entire quote. T.S. Eliot wrote this about, um, about poetry, but I believe this applies to all of our devotional writing as well. And so I'm going to just read it and we'll ponder it for a little bit and then we'll move on. T.S. Eliot was a British poet who wrote, uh, he had been an atheist and pretty much an ornery, ornery man angry at the God who didn't exist. And eventually <clears throat> he came to Christ. And uh, that is a wonderful story in and of itself. He wrote this. Why, I would ask, is most religious verse so bad? And why does so little religious verse reach the highest levels of poetry? Largely, I think, because of a pious insincerity. The capacity for writing poetry is rare. The capacity for religious emotion of the first intensity is rare. And it is to be expected that the existence of both capacities in the same individual should be rarer still. People who write devotional verse are usually writing as they want to feel rather than as they do feel. Now, when we read the Bible itself and we read the Psalms and we read some of the laments of the prophets, we hear this anguished honesty. How long, O oh Lord? Lord, don't you see the terrible things that are happening? Lord, look at Jerusalem, it's devastated. This sort of thing is authentic. And where those poets and those prophets and those writers end up gives us the kind of hope that we want to share with the world. So that is T.S. Eliot on authenticity. How do we do this at our daily bread? Um, 
Well, we, we start with the Bible reading, and we have several different elements that we really want people to concentrate on. I think one of one of the good things about our daily bread, um, if you, you can, uh, you know, the booklet yourself, it's um, it's it's pocket sized, so that's quite quite conducive to to being carried with a person and to, and to be read, but also um, the bread is story based, and the whole point of the story is to draw people in and to get them to read the Bible. We're also producing uh, a devotional that has the Our Daily Bread article on one side and the scripture reading on the other side because our, re our research, our focus groups revealed to us that 85% of the people who are reading Our Daily Bread were not reading the scripture, uh, which was a little bit discouraging, but that was, the realistic result of our our polling and so we came up with a scripture edition to also get people to read the bible so i don't know what kind of format you're going to be using or what you're working with if you're doing something online it may be very natural to have the scripture right there with it and i would encourage you to do that we keep the bible reading between four to twenty verses uh, anything longer than that gets to be too unwieldy it's too much to deal with in that bite-sized devotional that we want to give them. We want to give them enough to chew on for the moment, but we don't want to give them too much to where they're discouraged. We want them to have the habit of doing this every day. <clears throat> the Bible reading, we want it not just to be haphazard. We want it to be related directly to the theme of the devotional article. So we want to keep one thread going through this entire thing. It's not very much time that we have, so we really don't have time to develop to develop multiple themes or a secondary theme. We need to keep it focused. So that means we need a clear and logical beginning and a conclusion so that the scripture passage is kept in context. That's another thing I really want to stress. It's easy to find a verse that might make the point you want to make. But what is the actual context of that verse as it is used, used in the scripture? It is not rightly dividing the word of truth if we are just proof texting, taking a scripture to, to prove what we want it to say when that is not really the context of the passage. So we want to be really careful about that. At our daily bread, we actually have theological reviewers who will help us with that. And I understand a lot of you folks are out there in some remote places and you don't have many people to work with. So maybe you just get a trusted friend or a fellow pastor to help you and to read over what you're writing and to say, hey, what about this? Or have you thought of this? It's best to get a little help. So build the best team that you can in your situation. And also uh, in English, we are blessed with so many different translations of scripture. Choose one and interact with it that your audience will understand. And this comes back to understanding who you might be writing to. Uh, if I'm writing to the American West, I'm using a different language, a different style, and I might want to interact with a different uh, different scripture. If I'm interacting with somebody who, uh, if I'm writing to an audience that is not well versed in the scriptures, I might even use a paraphrase for them so they, they can understand it. You know your audience best, you know what they best understand. And it may well be that where you are, you only have one option for scripture. I understand that. Um, titling is a big part of the theme. And, and this is a uh, uh, this is a, a, a point where um, our marketing team at Our Daily Bread and some of our writers, myself included, we, um, we differ sometimes on what the title ought to be, and for good reasons. And I do defer to the marketing team because they know what they're doing. Titling, I'm trying to write something creative that is going to get attention. I, I want it to be something that gets people to think and that pulls them in. The marketing team is worried about searchability. 
uh, they're thinking about the web and uh, what is going to cause people who aren't reading our daily bread to say, hey, I want to read about that topic. So they advocate titles that are more descriptive and more like labels. I don't necessarily like that. I think it, uh, it, it hurts the art of the article a little bit. But I totally understand why we do that, and I defer to them and let them change my titles. Uh, also, it needs to tie to the theme. Don't be too clever in your titling. The key verse, we always want to include a, a key verse right below the title uh, so that that's the first thought the person will have as they're going into the article. And for that reason, we want to keep it brief. Very often, we have these pastors who who write for us and they want to include two and three verses right there that isn't really helpful for the reader you never want to give the reader an excuse to stop reading and so we work at more concise verses that will be related to the theme and it's very helpful if it's a proverbial verse something that's that's pithy that's catchy that's going to stay with you um, sometimes that may mean you'll borrow from another passage of scripture other than the read that you just gave them as long as it's related to the theme that is okay okay now speaking again about just the basic elements of this the main body of the article now we want this to be christ-centered of course the whole point of what we're doing is we want we want to uplift the preeminence of jesus we want it to be thoroughly Bible-based. We want it to be wisdom-oriented, and we want it to relate to the life of the person who is reading this. And that is the great thing about Scripture. So much of it, with the possible exceptions of the lists and the genealogies that we see in there, come right out of real-life situations, and they really direct directly relate to our lives today. Despite the fact that the world has changed so much, human nature has not changed at all. And the same principles that applied then apply now. Nothing has changed in that regard. So uh, we can keep this re life related and interact with the scriptures. There is no conflict there. Now here's where I was referencing uh, Indonesia a little bit earlier. I know this is already a problem uh, with the word count. Now, this word count I'm suggesting for you, uh, this is what works for our daily bread. What works in your language might be entirely different. Keep in mind your audience at all times. We like to keep things on one page because it is, it's proven that that works, that's appealing, and that is what people want to read, and that is what people do use. So we want to keep going with that. We've actually changed it to a word count with spaces of 1,500, uh, 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 character count, character count with spaces, 1,500 characters. Um, and that works pretty nicely for our English language. I know that in Indonesian, when they are translating our, our materials, um, they will be, they will be very, difficultly translated because the words are much longer it takes more to say what we're saying in english so even because of our indonesian readership we've trimmed our word count a little bit little by little to help them out uh, you you know what you know what you want to use oh i got ahead of myself here i want to go back one um the one theme this is critical very often when you're writing and when you're journaling, when I'm journaling, I freeform and I'm going all over the place. If you were doing that to your readers, one, you don't have the room to do it and to keep their interest. Uh, and the second thing is they're not going to be able to walk away remembering what you told them. They're going to be distracted. So we really want to focus on the one thing, that one big idea from start to finish. What might help you either before or after you've written your article is to write a theme statement for yourself. If you write it before, it may help you stay focused on that theme. If you read it afterwards and say, what is my theme here? 
it may, it may point out to you that you don't have one theme and you need to hone this article some more. Now, life-related illustrations. This is what we use for our daily bread. It may be that you use something else to get into it. Maybe it's a pressing question. So maybe you're not using something story-based. I'm telling you that the story used as an introduction for an article generally captures somebody's interest because the reason the story is, is good is because it's memorable, it's interesting, it's catchy. So Jesus used story, and that's what we want to use as well. There can be other things you might want to interact with. Um, you, you may be raising just a big question that people want answered. Uh, but the story is a great way to get their interest and to get into an article. Moving on to what else that looks like. What makes for a good illustration? Uh, well, of course, you want to be captivating and interesting, but how do you do that? And this is where working on the craft of writing really becomes key. Uh, I've, I've said that we work with a lot of ministers, a lot of pastors. And they're excellent speakers. They're fantastic speakers. That's why we want to use them. But when they write, they don't have the same space. They don't have the verbal, they don't have the nonverbal cues, the, the gestures, the facial expressions they can use. They can't really communicate that without, uh, without having a visual medium. So we have to work with them very often on their illustrations. And what we find very often, a key tendency for, for writers is to introduce the introduction. You don't need to do that. Start with the most compelling thing you have in your story. Grab them that way. Do that. And this is where you really are working on the craft of writing. The story is the key component to connecting the truth to life and the scriptures to our hearts and to our own experience. If they can see themselves in the story, I think of what Philip Yancey said at MAI last, uh, j just a, a month ago, when he wrote his memoir, he said, people read memoir and they connect to it because they see themselves. So it isn't even about me, it's about them. Keep that in mind as you're writing. Now, this comment, don't use short observations for the illustration. Um, that's a very big tendency for us to do. We go for walks and we're praying. Uh, I do that. And it's one of the ways that I, I pray. And we see something. And perhaps because we're, we're seeing something right there and we're praying, it reminds us of a, ca a characteristic of God. So we're tempted to write about that. And, you know, you say, I was walking and I saw this flower and, okay, that's not a particularly, a particularly compelling illustration. It gets pretty tired. It gets pretty cliched in a hurry. What you can do is write in a new and fresh way about what you saw. What was it that captivated you? Here's where you can really work on your craft. You can write about, you can describe the flower and, and just how brilliant it was or whatever it is, or how the sun just fell on it and showed it in a new way to you. Use something different. Don't just say, I saw this flower and it reminded me and it reminded me of. That's, that's uh, both a lazy illustration and a lazy transition. What we're trying to do as we write is to invite the readers to walk with us. Uh, we're all in this together. This is the whole point of authenticity that we're really working on. If they feel like you have experienced something they have experienced, now they feel they're not alone. And who knows where this person might be. We know we hear from a lot of prisoners who weren't even thinking about God until they wound up in a jail cell and somebody gave them in our daily bread and they didn't have much else to read. And so now this is what they're reading. Now, how do I write to a prisoner without making it feel like us and them? Because I'm on the outside and they're on the inside. I, I don't want them 
to feel like I'm on the outside and they're on the inside. I want them to feel like they can be my brother or sister in the Lord. The main body, uh, this goes back again to the introduction. Grabbing interest with the first sentence. <clears throat> Don't, when you, when, you, uh, when you write your material, I would suggest that you go back and read it over out loud. Go someplace quiet and read it out loud and see where it sounded clunky or see where you started to lose interest or where you think your reader might lose interest. Then go back and maybe that's where you need to cut something out. Major on the majors and minor on the minors. Now with our daily bread, we're non-denominational. So we're not going to take up anything that would create a, a mainstream uh, Christian Orthodox uh, division. We're not going to take up any sort of argument on, on, on some of the peripheral stuff that causes churches to split. We're going to major on holding up the preeminence of Christ and the unity that he prayed for in John 17. That isn't to say we ignore um, all kinds of questions that might be mildly divisive, but we're really going to concentrate on who Jesus is and what he is calling us to as fellow believers. Make each sentence count. Uh, we tend to, we're, we're, we're writers. We, we love to write. We tend to fall in love with our own voice. Um, we're not writing for ourselves. We're writing, first of all, to God, and uh, second, to the people he is calling. And we want each word, each sentence to, be, to count. Using words that people can understand. Um, we like to write, so we're literate. Sometimes we want to show off a little bit. Really don't let that get in the way of your devotional writing. And uh, this, this works for English. Um, it, it may be a masculine way of writing. I don't know. We, we write about propositional truth. So we write about things that are. So we tend to use that kind of language where we say, this is true. By using active verbs, you keep your writing moving along much more crisply. And uh, it takes less effort. It's easier for people to read. It's more inviting. Uh, I can't stress this one uh, strongly enough. Check the facts. This is where other people helping you and to have some kind of an editorial staff is wonderful because we assume we knew something and it turns out we remember we misremembered something or we had our facts wrong. To begin with, everybody makes mistakes at one point or another. And the more sets of eyes you can have on something, the better off you are. Especially be biblically accurate. Okay. And also about the main body. Um, I love this quote from my fellow, our daily bread writer, Patricia Rabin. We're writing about the big story, God's big story. She said this. God has already written every story. We are simply invited to come to the keyboard and take dictation. Now, she's not saying that the first draft that we put on the page is fully inspired. No, uh, that's where the work begins. But because our stories interact with God's story, because we're all part of God's story, whatever we have to say is what he has shown us in this particular day. So we want it to reflect God's story. And we do that by interacting constantly with the Bible and lifting up the character of God as the one who can be known. This is what the world really doesn't get. Everyone in the world is spiritual. Even the atheists who say they are not are really spiritual and they're spiritually hungry. And by lifting up the, key, the character and the reality of the God who can be known, we're making them hungry for that, thirsty for that. As, uh, as a guy I met at MAI at, at Lit World told me um, when I was telling him about my agnostic cousin who was suddenly interested in my life and couldn't understand how I could be religious, 
he put it this way. He said, ah, he tasted the salt in you. I think that's what we want. We want the salt and the light to come through. And that's why, that's why we hold up the character of God as the one who can be known. It's the point of the Bible. God can be known. <clears throat> How do we engage both head and heart? And this one I can't stress enough. Don't give them a reason to quit reading. Uh, if you uh, don't don't get people to read your drafts that are going to be yes people. Don't get them to be just fans. I can give something to my wife to read because I know she's going to give me an honest opinion. She's going to shoot straight with me. And if she says, well, if she starts it like that, I already know I'm missing the point somewhere. I'm missing it somewhere. So get those kinds of helpful critics who will really tell you, this is a little muddled. I don't understand this. You could be more clear here. I got bored here. Get that kind of reviewer. That requires creative and engaging writing. And that is something we can always work on. And again, the honesty and the vulnerability. I want to talk a little bit about what honesty and candor and openness is not. Um, I have read the kinds of things uh, where, where, where people have probably shared more than they should have. Um, and what I mean by that, you, you can allude to a challenge you have in your life without sharing too many details. Uh, at some point, it seems to become exhibitionistic, not open and honest and vulnerable. You want to be careful about that. And uh, uh, another thing is you, you never want to put somebody else out there or expose them. You want to protect other people as well. So some stories... Maybe you just write them for yourself, but you don't share them with other people. You can write out of those experiences, but that might not be for publication. I think you know what I'm talking about. And heartfelt topics. Obviously, if you're not feeling passionate about this topic, you're going to be guilty of writing the kind of thing that T.S. Eliot warned against. You're writing about how you want to feel and not how you actually do feel. And it's okay to be angry and maybe even yell at God a little bit. Although I, I hope you wouldn't do that. He's certainly big enough to take it. And he's going to be there after you're done yelling and he's going to love you. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we want our readers to see. Strong story-based illustrations are what we go for. And a seamless scripture interaction, the transitions, in a short article can be very, very difficult. This is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and also writing a conclusion can be one of the biggest challenges because you need more room, really, and, and it's tough to do that. <clears throat> the transitions, try to avoid the sort of thing where you're just saying, that reminded me of. Uh, I think it's better to say, this story in the Bible, this story compares to that and do it that way. So you can make the connection between the illustration and the scripture that way. And then the application to our lives, since it's somebody else's life and it happened in the scripture as well, then it becomes more obvious. Now, sometimes the best way to conclude is by asking a question. Don't ask a question that is going to be a yes or no answer. Ask a question that will really uh, help people un think, think differently about the topic. So an open-ended question to say, how, does the, how will you put this into practice today? Or write down two particular ways in which you will take this to God. That sort of thing where you're getting something, you're getting the reader to do something. And again, um, I do like to read my own work out loud because then I'm hearing it and I'm, I'm able to edit in a different way. 
And if my heart isn't responding to God, maybe I have missed the boat. So we use some additional elements, sometimes at the very bottom of the page, and sometimes they're on a facing page. And uh, application questions are really a really nice tool to reel people in and to get them to do something. Um, brief prayers. It, it seems sometimes a little counterproductive to write a brief prayer, but you're getting you're writing to people who might not even know how to pray. So just a brief prayer might show them how it's done. And it also is a natural way to turn the focus right back onto God. A proverbial conclusion, uh, our Africa region is really fond of, of these sorts of things. The thought at the bottom of the page, very pithy, very concise and memorable. That's one thing they might take with them throughout the day. Or then you might, this might be a place where you can use for further reading, which, uh, which will be, um, you could, it's even a place for you to promote maybe some of your own organization's materials or something else you have written, or one of your favorite Christian authors somewhere. Uh, that might be a link that you can put in there or, or bibliography. Uh, again, keep it brief, keep it brief. Um, we have a scripture, in the scripture edition that we have, we use the article on one page. We have four to 20 verses on the facing page. And at the bottom of that facing page, we will add a paragraph of about 100 words of additional insight where you can address maybe a historical context or maybe what another scholar or a theologian has said about this topic, or maybe address a secondary theme that has arisen as you've written the article. That is a good place to handle that sort of thing. And an uh, awful lot of readers really like that because they're already interested in spiritual matters, and this gives them an opportunity to go deeper. So, um, this word "glocal" <coughs> uh, prayers and thoughts. Th thinking globally, you're thinking globally and locally. Um, we write. We try to write as globally as possible. But you, uh, if you're in a country that maybe it's just it's a small country, I notice we have a a writer from Somalia here. That's exciting. You can write particularly to the situation in your country, in your region, and you know what is going what is going to work there. And also what you are writing can bless other people who might read it elsewhere. So keep that in mind. So think both globally and locally. Um, if you use songs or poems, please beware of possible copyright infringement. We want to be good stewards of our material and of others, and we want to follow the copyright laws and uh, the, the brief but the genuine prayers, of course. Um, we use research links that will promote, promote things like a, a global university that we have here, Christian, Christian Network and uh, partnerships, upcoming events. Hey, you might want to promote MAI with, with something. That's the sort of thing we might put, but that we don't want this sort of thing to detract from the article. So it's always right at the bottom, uh, very subtly there. It's, it's not prominently featured. This is not an advertisement. Uh, it's just inviting people to check something out that, that might help them grow. Keep in mind your target audience always for our daily bread. And your target audience may be different than ours. Uh, we're assuming that most of these people are believers in Jesus. Now, we're also not going to assume that they all are because they're not. So we want to keep away from Christian jargon. And I, th I think you know what, I'm, what I mean by that. We don't want to use theological terms that we might readily understand that a new Christian or a person who has been a nominal Christian for so long just might not understand. So this really challenges us to find new ways to explain things in, in a way that they will be understandable to uh, even a brand new Christian. At the same time, we're making consistent appeals to non-Christians, inviting them to consider the reality of God and the sacrifice that Jesus has made for them on the cross. And uh, also we want, we especially want to do that in 
in terms that won't be uh, Christianese, we call it. We, we want it to be in terms they can understand. And we want to appeal to, as Jesus did, people of all socioeconomic classes. It's fascinating to me to read through the Gospels and see how Jesus just naturally interacted with people across the strata. He meets with this respected Jewish leader in John 3, in Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. In the very next chapter, he goes on, he goes on to talk about, he goes on to talk to the woman at the well, an outcast even in Samaria because she'd had five husbands from the despised people group. And he gives them the same opportunities. That's the kind of thing we want to be doing. And uh, obviously people from varied tribes and ethnicities, that can be a real challenge wherever you are. I'm just thinking of how many different tribes and ethnicities are in a country like Nigeria. So um, that will create your own set of challenges. And we aim for a, a, a secondary school reading, uh, middle school forms one, two, whatever terminology you use in, in, in your culture. Um, basically uh, an intelligent and literate 13 year old on up. And obviously we wanna appeal to both male and female. Generally it's an adult readership, but also astute young people. I see we're getting uh, some, some questions here that uh, I want to get to. Uh, we're about to wrap this up. I just wanted to talk about, uh, I'll just share this slide with you. And our daily bread devotional, um, what is that? Uh, I just lost my page, let's go back one. It is, it lifts our hearts toward God. It's not a sermon, a lecture or authoritarian uh, uh, exposition on how to live. Rather, it encourages us to connect with God and leaves us with a renewed sense of gratefulness and hope. We're always going for that hopeful conclusion, regardless of what the article has been about. And even Lamentations itself contains hope. Um, I noticed somebody here has asked examples of Christian jargon to avoid, please. Well, sometimes we're fish swimming in water, so we don't even know that we're saying it. But just to use an obvious obvious term, uh, we could talk about uh, this could lead to our sanctification. Okay, well, now you've just scared off new Christians or, or intimidated them because they don't know what that is. So rather than that, describe how uh, sanctification is the life that Jesus is calling us into, where we are growing closer and closer to be more like him, where we are set apart. And you may want to use the word and then explain exactly what it means in a way that is not condescending. So uh, another example of a Christian jargon word to avoid. Um, uh, of course, I'm not thinking of them off the top. Well, even words like, even words like blessed. Uh, um, what does that mean? So, oh yes, abundant life. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> what, what is the abundant life? Alive to the Spirit. We may need to explain the Holy Spirit. And there are lots of words coming in here. Justification. Yes. What does it mean to be justified before God? It's everything. It, we all want that, but what does it mean? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing here and come back to this. Um, and I believe we do have some other questions as well. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tim. You've given us uh, a lot of tips, helpful tips indeed. Um, I was thinking if you could perhaps show an example of what you've written, a one-page devotional. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, sure. Um, well, I, I don't like to be a self-promoter, but this is my book, Brother to Brother. Okay. okay. Um, and... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, they did a really nice job with this. Um, this was done in the form of a journal. Mm. And uh, so the, the, this just uh, some of my writings. And um, I, I may want to, uh, I may want to share something with you. Um, 
a lot of these are uh, a lot of these are are directed more more towards men, but, but that was on purpose. Uh, let's see. I'll just choose one to read very quickly, and since it's not long, uh, it won't take too long. So. Um, this is a, this is called space for me. And we're, we're aiming this at men. That's just this particular article. So, and, uh, I, we use the verse, we use Mark three, 13 through 19 as the scripture. And then, uh, for that, I chose Mark three 13, which was the main point I wanted to emphasize. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. The article is just a couple hundred words. He was an aging military veteran, rough aged, rough edged, and given to even rougher language. So now you're picturing what this guy is like. One day, a friend cared enough about him to inquire about his spiritual beliefs. The man's dis this dismissive response came quickly. God doesn't have space for someone like me. Perhaps it was just part of his tough guy act, but his words couldn't be further from the truth. God creates space, especially for the rough, the guilt-ridden, and the excluded to belong and thrive in his community. This was obvious from the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he made some surprising choices for his disciples. First, he chose several fishermen from Galilee, the wrong side of the tracks from the perspective of those in Jerusalem. He also selected a tax collector, Matthew, whose profession included extorting from his, his oppressed countrymen. Then, for good measure, Jesus invited the other Simon, the zealot. We don't know much about this Simon. He isn't Simon Peter, but we do know about the zealots. They hated traitors like Matthew, who got rich by collaborating with the despised Romans. Yet, with divine irony, Jesus chose Simon, along with Matthew, brought them together, and blended them into his team. Don't write off anyone is too bad for Jesus. After all, he said, I have not called to call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He has plenty of space for the, tough, for the tough cases, people like you and me. And I noticed as I read that, that I used a, a Christianese word uh, when I said divine irony. I... I might, I might not want to use the word divine. Um, what does that mean to the kind of person I want to draw in with this article? So um, other questions. I believe we had some other questions that. Uh, yeah, were... thank you so much for sharing that. Tim, uh, actually, yeah, a few of, of them, uh, of our participants wrote their questions when they registered, like, Oh, so Carlos, what is the most challenging of the difficulty and the daunting task of writing a devotional? What's the most challenging part for you? That's a great question. And I don't want to narrow it down to one thing, but he asked me, what is the one thing? So I'll talk about one thing first, then I'll talk about three separate problems I have. I'll try to make that quick. Um, my one biggest challenge, I think, is to keep my writing truly devotional. Uh, am I truly seeking God? Am I helping others to seek and glorify him? And related to that biggest challenge, um, first is the need to check my own ego at the door uh, to avoid, you know, falling in love with the sound of my own voice. You know, a lot of us have been writing since we were kids and loved it. That's why we want to be here and write devotionally. Um, so we can, we can check that by taking care of first things first. I think by listening for the voice of God and seeking him actively, and that's got to be, that's got to be something we do all the time. And by listening for that still small voice. But uh, I also want to talk though about the technical aspect of keeping it concise. And that is a huge challenge as well. Mm -hmm. Just deal with the one topic. If, if a secondary topic comes up, uh, reference it if you have to but don't let it get in the way of that one thought and then come back to it in a subsequent piece. Maybe tell them we'll deal with this in, a, in, a, in another blog or whatever, whatever it is that you do. Anna, 
A third thing is we have to be careful to divide the word of truth properly. Uh, don't, don't proof text carelessly and be really careful. Uh, what, what, what are you, why are you using this scripture to make this point? Please don't abuse the text. So that's something you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have several questions here. Marshall Davis, uh, can you say something more about the theological reviewers uh, of the ODB team? Theological reviewers. Yes, we have, we have uh, theological reviewers. Um, in fact, it's so layered. Uh, we go through an evaluation first when the articles come in, and we use about 30 different writers now. Um, so it goes through a screening process initially from the editorial team. And then once they've come together and got the articles ready, it goes to a theological and a cultural review because we, we go out to so many different cultures, we can't possibly know what might be offensive or ineffective in every culture. That's where we need your help. And uh, sometimes after we have gotten the article already, a theological reviewer who's uh, smarter than we are says, hey, you, you're, you're misusing this text. And a cultural reviewer might say, we can't publish that here. And that's, that's good to know. It's so good to get a, that. a smaller team could maybe an outside pastor, a trusted Yes, you know, a trusted uh, pastor would be a good resource okay. or, or better yet, two, two pastors two to pastors. help you with theological review. You know, okay. iron sharpens iron. Iron yes. sharpens iron. Amen. Yeah, you, you said uh, use Bible translations that your readers can understand. So do you use yes. several? Uh, Benedita Nambu, uh, Nambui is uh, asking. Yes, we we do we we use the NIV typically, but uh, when we're writing a special ed edition, we'll switch to the New Living Translation more often because those special editions are written on particular themes, and so that devotional is going to go very often to people who are not uh, well versed in the scriptures, and uh, the New Living Translation is more conversational. We have several writers who like to interact with the message. Now, obviously, that is a paraphrase, um, but it can still help people, uh, it can still help introduce people to the God of the Bible. Uh, Eugene Peterson did careful work with that, and he did it to expand ministry, not to say this is the word of God. So yes, we do on occasion interact with the, with the message. Okay, thank you. Hazel Joy, how to relate and stitch an old biblical insight into a contemporary setting story? Hmm. How to use an old biblical insight? Uh, I'm assuming, I, I don't know if you're talking about maybe a piece of classical literature or, uh, or the scripture itself. If it's, a if it's a piece of classical literature, and I love to write about these things, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I want to introduce people to some of the classics and maybe get them to understand that it really does have something to say to them today. That's where we get tested as, uh, as writers, because that can be a big challenge to make something that is written in a more older style to make it fresh for today. So that's where we become, in essence, cultural translators reaching across the generations. Yeah. Um, as to writing like old stories from the Bible, uh, the human condition hasn't changed. And so I think it's those right, yeah. remain, remain uh, very pertinent. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, writing for a digital audience. Uh, is it any yes. different from Scott? Yes, uh, using links is, that definitely gives you that option. And that is, uh, uh, we're, we're using that. We, we have, uh, we also use video as well. And so that's script writing and that's a different, different venue. And uh, that's exciting what we're doing there. And that gets 
even more brief sometimes because uh, people watch the video for 45 seconds and they're done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Jeremy Abdel is uh, now based in Somalia. But I think this is the first time we ha had somebody from Somalia. So he is, yeah, and he's learning the language. So Tim, I was wondering if you ever wrote devotionals for the people you were serving. So he's a missionary there. How did you write your first devotional for them? Any tips for mission workers? Oh, do you mean in in Africa? Yes. Yeah, I I haven't been there. Well, I've I've visited again, but I haven't lived there since I was a child. But um, I write out of that experience, and uh, I find that that's an advantage because people love to see their country and their culture interacted with. But um, I lived up in the interior, which is a very different part of Ghana than Southern Ghana. So the culture, there's, there's a cultural challenge there. Uh, but I do, I do write about my African experiences. Uh, so snake stories and that sort of thing. It's, it's a wealth of material to draw on. Um, I do find that we can help people, a, a larger audience understand a little bit more of the world by writing about the particularities of, of where we come from. Uh, and, and people like me who are cross-cultural, I think that's one of our callings is, is to help do that. Uh, I, I hope I answered that question. Uh, well, I don't write yeah. two missionaries uh, per se, and uh, that, that isn't something I've felt led to do yet. Um, yeah. I see somebody well, references the Africa Study Bible here, which I don't have on this desk, but is on my desk. <laughs> And it, it engages Proverbs on every single page and all kinds of different cultures. They've really done a good job with that one, yeah. Well, in your presentation, you said, uh, always think of your audience and, and how would they read your material? So always have your audience in mind when you write the devotionals, as you, as yes. you said, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, Hankuri, uh, please share how you have, approach writing devotional notes on a given Bible book. How, please, can you share how you have approached writing devotional notes on a given Bible book? Oh, yes. Well, um, this is where journaling while I do my own personal quiet time is really valuable mm -hmm. um, because Thoughts will occur to me as I am reading, and you, I think you've all experienced this. You're, you're reading a passage of scripture that you have read you don't know how many times before, and all of a sudden, you see something you haven't seen before, and you can't believe it. Why did I never notice this? Write it down. Write it down right then. That's, that's how I deal with it. And then go back and dive into it at length and, and see why the this new fresh insight came to you and then share it with your readers because if it's exciting to you it's going to be exciting to somebody else and you want mm -hmm. to capture that excitement as you're experiencing it so mm -hmm. thank you um do's and don'ts in relating a contemporary story so that it will not go out of context hazel joy oh that's a good question mm -hmm. and that again uh knowing your audience or knowing what you're writing for uh boy we could talk for 10 or 15 minutes on that um mm -hmm. i don't want to say i don't want to say more than i know uh if you may need to write just to a particular cultural context because somebody needs to hear that so i don't know that because something won't have staying power because it will go out of context but if you were if you are writing through a specific situation, say a big crisis happened, everyone, everyone knows what it is. Uh, you know, it's a 9-11 type event or in your country, it's when the civil war happened or whatever, or an earthquake, you know, anything like that. You're writing to that particular issue because that's what people want then. You might be able to go back and repurpose that later to apply to other kinds of crises that are similar. Um, 
So we we have done that where you can you can write specifically to like the tsunami, but then take what you've written and repurpose it, write it a little bit differently, and apply it to other sorts of horrible tragedies. Um, so I think you can do both. Thank you. I, I noticed somebody asked the question: uh, Do you start with the illustration, or uh, or no. I can't speak for all all the writers, um, but yes or no. My own personal way is is very different. Sometimes when I'm reading scriptures, like, oh wow, thank you, Lord, I need to write about this, but I don't have an illustration. Other times I get a wonderful illustration and then I try to force the wrong scripture on it and I just, it just languishes on my desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have a formula for how to do this other than keep reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit will bring things to mind and you can bring the, these things together. Uh, the, the worst case scenario, I kept an article idea for seven years before I finally had the right illustration for it and it worked. I can't remember what it is now, but seven years. Seven years, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, our daily bread would usually have different scripture passages for, let's say, in a month, not not a book study straight. Yeah, right? we don't do we don't do book studies for our daily bread, but we do for the discovery series, which is a companion okay. piece, which is about the same size. Um, okay. It's right in your pocket, thirty-two pages. Uh, that will be theme oriented and it gives the writer much more freedom. It can be a, a book study. It can be a topic study. Uh, grief is a big topic, of course, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Very good. How do you balance being a writer and an editor? Uh, well, I think that really helps me. I had the wonderful privilege of working as uh, an editor, the assistant editor for years. Um, and, uh, so I'm sitting in the committee and I'm learning from all these older editors and getting all this experience and seeing how hard it is to get that down to 220 words or whatever. And so that really taught me how hard it was. And I was writing for other people and I got bigger word count, which was much easier. Mm -hmm. Then when they asked me to write for our daily bread, I already kind of knew how hard it was. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Also, as an editor and a writer, I think it gives me empathy. Oh, it does give me empathy for the writers I'm working with. And uh, I understand their pain. So I think it really, it, I think in this case, it's a very good balance. I don't think there's a okay. tension there at all. And by the way, when they're editing my articles, I leave the room. <laughs> I'm not a part of that conversation at that point. <laughs> do, you, do you invite people to write for you? Because Rose is asking, how can one become a contributing writer to ODB? Well, at the moment, we're, we're not looking here, but um, we go through the country directors. Um, okay. And uh, people are welcome to submit things, but um, the, uh, the possibility, we're not, we're not saying, oh yeah, we're looking for writers. We're always looking to develop people, but uh, we, we want them to understand it's, it's, it's a big challenge. And at the moment, uh, there's no needs, but um, you know, get get your get your stuff out there. Get it to people. Uh, we have we have offices all over the world, and, and get your material to the editorial staff there, and just say, what do you think? Can you give me honest feedback? So. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Saying uh, she used ODB for the first time, uh, given to her by their neighbor. And she was an un non-believer at the time. And oh wow. Wow. So that's how God uses. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for I sharing love... that, Maria Luisa. Yeah. So a neighbor gave her uh, one ODB and 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 that really I think contributed to her becoming a believer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we're the uh, last question, do you have a devotional dummy to be used by other writers, say David, <laughs> or a template? What, what was the question again? Uh, do you have a devotional dummy or a template? Oh, a template. Uh, 
we we now just use word documents and let the typesetter worry about the template <laughs> okay uh, uh, we use a graphics person for that. I used to write right into a, an InDesign Word template so I could write it to the right size. Uh, now they they put us on a character count for that. So that's that's how our process has changed. We we don't use a template. It may be good for you to create a template and use. Um, but what uh, to what to put can... on the first part, the body and the concluding? Oh, yeah. Well, we. You get your layout and you might want a designer to help you with this if you don't have design skills, but uh, you know the title and then the verse beneath it and then the, the scripture read and then the body of the text and then the author's name at the bottom and the questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, is it all right to share your PowerPoint slides with our yes, audience? Yes, I have yes. no trouble with that whatsoever. Okay, so you will send it to me and then I will share it with them and I send the link out. Certainly. Uh, the day. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, before we end, just give them an, your parting words of encouragement, your, your final words for our people who have uh, registered and have joined us live. Today. Well, it's, it's been a real privilege to talk to you and uh, Keep in mind that that we're not doing this for uh, if, even if you're writing this for one person, that's fine because God can use the power of the one and turn it into so much. So if you have if you feel the calling to write, um, then God has likely given you that calling and uh, he, then he's also gifted you. But remember that good writing is hard work. Um, mm -hmm there are those rare occasions when it just flows and we're able to say what we want but usually you get the first draft on the page and then you sulk about it for a while and but don't don't give up good writing is rewriting and rewriting and if god has given you this calling then please stick with it we owe it to him to do our best and do it as unto him so, amen okay. amen Thank you so much and thank you everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for interaction, your, your comments. Uh, thank you very much. We are encouraged. We are glad that you have joined us. We will uh, send you the link uh, to this recording, uh, to this webinar uh, and also the slides of Tim. And uh, we pray that the Lord will really give you wisdom and strength to write devotionals that will make uh, Christ known and let the church grow and um, now all for the glory of, of God. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Tim, for being our resource a speaker today and uh, look forward, our audience look forward to our next uh, webinar. We will send you the invitation for next month's webinar and uh, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Um, if you feel that the topic will be helpful, uh, send out forward the invitation to your friends and colleagues as well so they could register. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening to the people in uh, Asia and Australia. Um, have a good rest of the day for Europe and Africa and have a good day for people in North, Central and South America. God bless you all. Keep writing. Yes. Goodbye. Bye for now.